I titled this morning's message, But What About Today? And as we move forward in the message, you'll begin to understand what, it, what I'm trying to say. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to actually read verses 1 through 12. I would say that the way that I'm interpreting or the way that I'm preaching out of this passage is not exactly the way that it's written. And I'll explain to you the, the, what I'm talking about as we move forward. But let's just go ahead and read it. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So just to give you a little bit of context while we're right here, they were being troubled. The church of Thessalonica, if I was going to draw you a map up there, the church of Thessalonica was in the city called Thessal Thessalonica, and it was in Asia Minor. And uh, they were Gentile believers who had gotten saved. Never, They weren't Jews. They never knew about the Lord Jesus Christ before. But now they've heard the gospel. Now they're saved. But there's other people on the outside that are writing letters and that they're trying to convince the church that the day of Jesus has already happened. That, in other words, the day of the Lord has already happened. The rapture of the church has taken place. And that that's why the Thessalonian believers are suffering great persecution. Um, but I have to tell you that not only here, so the apostle Paul's having to bring correction because no, the, Lord, the day of the Lord has not showed up yet. The rapture of the church hasn't taken place. You're just under persecution. And in addition to make it worse, it's as though somebody had forged a letter from the apostle Paul stating that, hey, Paul's the one that's saying this, that the day of the Lord is already at hand. Now, I got to tell you that you know, the church has suffered persecution through the years on multiple occasions. But that doesn't mean that, there, that, we're, that we're yet in the midst of the great tribulation. The reality of it is, is that, is that many times persecution happens. But in order for us to understand that that time that they were thinking was not yet. And so one of the reasons that he was writing this letter is because people were freaking out so bad, for lack of better words, that they were quitting their jobs, that they weren't moving forward with life as usual. He explains that in chapter 3. He said that if you don't work, you don't eat. Right? right? And it's very important that we understand that, that. You know, we also, that's another thing. I didn't really plan on getting into a social type gospel, but but many times, you know, the reality of it is, is that people are very entitled in today's society. Right, right. I mean, people believe that they have things owed to them. Amen. Okay, no, no, nobody owes you or I anything. Amen. Amen. And, and that the word of God teaches that we're supposed to get out there and we're supposed to work for what it is. Now, in, in the beginning, when God created the man and woman and created them and placed them in the garden, he said to tend and to keep. God planned for mankind to take care of things and to be busy about doing his work. Amen. There's no greater work than to do the work of the kingdom. Hallelujah. To preach the truth of the gospel. Amen. And whenever you and I learn to submit our lives to the Lord, he will put in us the desire to work. Amen. And to be productive. Because let me tell you, I, I didn't really, I, I promise you, I didn't plan on getting this far into this. But let me say this. If you go around speaking Jesus out of your mouth, people are watching the way that you work. Amen. Amen. Like, listen, if you're always calling into work because you're the one that's always sick. Come on, somebody. Don't get mad at me now. If that's you. Just, just keep your face straight. Act like I'm not talking to you. If you're the one that's always calling into work sick. If you're the one that's always leaving something out for somebody else to pick up the slack. Trust me, the people that you work with are frustrated with you. Amen. No, that's not how Jesus came to serve. Amen. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister unto others and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. There's a truth connected to that that will affect your work ethic. You should be, and Lord help me here because this is one place that I do fall short sometimes. We should be the first one there, amen, and we should be willing not to leave until we make sure that everybody's good to go. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. And in the meantime, from the, from the time the clock starts to the time the clock ends, we should be try, striving to be the most productive person there. Amen. amen. No, if you don't work, you don't eat. 
We can't live. We cannot partake of an entitled society. The Holy Spirit in us will change us. Anyway, they, they, they were throwing all sheets to the wind. Oh, the day of the Lord is at hand. The wrath of God is upon us. Persecution prevails. It's time to quit everything. Uh, you know, it's, it's all over. No, the Apostle Paul said, no, we didn't write that letter. There's some things that are going to take place. And he goes on to say that. He says... Uh, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So he's saying there's some things that are going to take place first before you see the return of the Lord, before you see the rapture of the church. Before you see the wrath of God poured out the day of the Lord upon mankind, there's some things that are going to take place. Number one, I got to tell you, it says it's going to be a falling away. There's different interpretations to some of what these passages are saying. So I'm going to explain to you what I believe after multiple hours and time of studying what I believe to be the case in some of these passages. Number one, there's going to be a falling away first. All right. Number two, the man of sin will be revealed. Now. This is, this is good news. For whether you be pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation, it does not matter. Because one way or the other, the, the man of sin is going to be revealed. Whether he's revealed on the front end, I'm talking about Daniel chapter 9. We don't have time to go there. But in Daniel chapter 9, it explains very clearly a system of weeks. Equals out to 490 years, right? 490 years total. Seven sets of... Of, of, of 70 years that equal out to 490 years and the last seven represents the last seven years that may, that will be known to mankind represents the last seven year period of, of what we call what scholars have called the great tribulation it begins that last seven years begins some people have said it begins with the rapture of the church i'm not convinced of that well, as a matter of fact what i believe begins it is the stroking of the pen it says in daniel chapter 9 that he talking about the antichrist will sign a covenant with his people and when he signs that peace agreement or he confirms it or reaffirms it whatever the terminology is there it begins the time clock it's almost as though during the time frame of the church age, the, the, the prophetic time clock has been stopped, if you will, in a way. And that for the for the church age, there's been like somewhere around 2,000 years, but then, but then whenever that agreement is signed, that time clock begins again, and it will begin that last seven-year period. So this is the point that I'm trying to make. That whether he's revealed on the front end, whenever he signs it, and people are like, aha, there it is, and the rapture takes place right then and there, or whether it becomes, it says in Daniel chapter 9, in the middle of the week, he will break that covenant. It's going to be real clear then. It's going to be very clear at that point in time. He will have signed it, and then he will have broken it. And the point being is this, is that he will be revealed. So there's some things that are going to happen first. There's going to be a great falling away, and there's also going to be that the man of sin also known, known as the, the son of perdition. He's not going to, the, the man of sin, it means he's the lawless one. And the, the, he, will ha, he, will, he will produce a society, he will attempt to produce a society that all, all men and women want to live according to what, what it is that they want to live according to, no longer want to live according to the will of God or the ways of God. Listen to me, he's operating right now today. He's the son of perdition. He, he, he's the one that will go to destruction. Look at verse 4. This is what he does. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. That's a, yeah, I didn't mean to get into this this deep because this wasn't really a, uh, an end times message as much as it was a today message. But I want to tell you that when you get into Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and it talks about the harlot, which is false religion, writing the back of these false governments that have tried to overcome God's authority upon earth, that one day that the, that the beast system is going to turn on false religion. And that's his, this is another scripture that describes that because he will exalt himself and he will say nothing can be. You see, right now they come against Christianity. 
I'm just, I'm just preparing you and showing you what the spirit of Antichrist is doing. Right now, the spirit of Antichrist comes against Christianity. And it says, listen to me, don't come against the Buddha, don't come against Allah, don't come against all these other ones. It just comes against Christianity and the focal point is on that. But there's going to be a day when he's not going to be happy with any of that. And he's going to say, no, you must worship me and you must bow down before me is what he's going to say. He says, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Listen, if you looked in the Greek for these words withholdeth and then later on, later on the word let is going to be used. Let or leteth, okay? All of these words essentially could be, I'm just explaining this to you so that we're on the same page. Could, all of these words could be translated as restraint. Okay, so if you looked it up in the Greek, the King James uses some different wording, but it could all be translated as restraint. So that's what word we're going to use. Amen. So that we're all on the same page. And now you know what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, there's some kind of a power source that's restraining him, the son of perdition, the lawless one from being revealed. From the beginning of time, really since the Tower of Babel, the enemy of our soul has tried to make a one world order, a one world government, a one world religion, has tried to exalt himself above the plan of God, above the throne of God. I'm not making something up. This is easy. Just Google it. Uh, old man Bush saying new world order. World leaders saying new world order. And just watch how many times you see. They've been saying it for, for God knows how long since we've had the advent of video. It's all documented up there. Even somebody was circulating one with Obama saying it the other day. It was on. I, I didn't even mean to get into all this, but I'm going to get into it because you need to be prepared. There was a video just the other day of President Obama saying, now is the time. People can't make decisions for themselves. They must all submit under one authority that will take care of them. That's what's going on in this world today. But it's been going on. It's just moving closer and closer towards that time. And he says, now you know that which withholds or restrains that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, God is going to allow the man of sin to be revealed when the time is right. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. It's already happening and it has been happening. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Many people have interpreted this, and, and it doesn't, it's, it's up to you however you want to interpret it. You're going to read a lot of different people. Some people say it's the Archangel Michael. Some people say it's the church. I believe it's the Holy Spirit moving through the church that restrains the man of sin. It's the Holy Spirit that has been restraining the work of the enemy throughout the ages. And when God is ready, to, and it, whether it means the rapture of the church because the church is gone because the Holy Spirit's in the church, or whether it means the Holy Spirit just removes his hand a little bit to allow him to be revealed because that is the time. Whether that be, whatever the case may be, it's the Holy Spirit that has been working and preventing the enemy from allowing his work to come forward, all right? Amen. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So what I want you to see is this. Even if you go back to the book of Exodus, you remember what happened in the book of Exodus when God told Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they might worship me. You remember that story? And what happened? Moses went to Pharaoh and said, hey, God said, let his people go so that they might worship him. And what happened? They started to his magicians. What did they do? They threw their staff on the ground. And what happened? It turned into a snake. Right. 
And so what happened? Moses threw his staff on the ground and his staff turned into a snake and gobbled up their snake. What is that? What is the point to it, preacher? The point is, is that the enemy has power. God allows him to have power because many times people want to be deceived. I'm just saying. Many times people don't want to believe what the word of God says. Many times people want to go their own way instead of going God's way. And God allows them to have what it is that they want to have. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person that's charmed by the snake, if you will. That's deceived by the ways of the enemy. I don't want to be him. And he says in verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So once again, this was a letter in response to a false teaching that said that the rapture had taken place, that the wrath of God was being poured out. People were quitting their jobs. People were just didn't really, they didn't, they weren't responding properly anymore. They weren't trusting in the Lord. Amen. They had been deceived by a false letter. They had been deceived by false doctrine. And this just shows you how people can move in a direction that is against the will of God. It is, a, it is God's will, again, that people work and provide for themselves and their families. It's God, God's will that people help others. But it's not God's will that people live their lives dependent on anyone but Him. Amen? Amen. Yes. Amen. And that's why I titled this message, though, But What About Today? Because you see, this letter is speaking specifically about future events. It's speaking about the rapture. It's speaking about the end times. It's speaking about the, the Antichrist being revealed. But, but my question this morning is, but what about today? And it was what I was feeling in my spirit when we were worshiping the Lord this morning. And I was like, you know what? Sing it again. Sing it again. What a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Like, I mean, whenever you think about those words right there, what does it do to your spirit? Isn't he wonderful? Is he wonderful in your life or is something else wonderful in your life? Is something else when you talk about it gets you excited and get your, get your passion flowing and gets you, you know, up and ready to move? Or is it Jesus? Does the name of Jesus stimulate you? Does the name, does talking about the Lord and talking about the gospel and talking about the truth, does it stimulate you? Because I'm here to tell you this morning that if it doesn't, then there's something wrong with you. If, if it doesn't do it for me, there's something wrong with me. If, if what we're being stimulated by is talk about football, Talk about whatever the case, but we can't be stimulated by talk about Jesus. Something is wrong on the inside of us. And I don't say that to poke you in the eye or to get you mad at me. I want you to love me when it's all said and done. But I don't want you to love me at the expense that I can't tell you the truth. And if we're not getting excited about Jesus and about the word of God and about the opportunity to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, then something is wrong with us. Lord, help us. What about today? Amen. Amen. First thing I want to talk to you about is our gathering. That's the word that's used here in 2 Thessalonians. It says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. This word gathering right here in the Greek is, is, is this is how you would write it out. If you were going to write it in English. Epi synagogue. Which is where we get our word, what? Synagogue, right? So this word here can mean upon or above. And this word here can mean gathering or collection. That's what a synagogue is, right? It's a gathering of people that come together and they worship, right? So you could say that what this word means is our above gathering. That would be a very strict interpretation. Our above gathering. In other words, one day we're going to meet him in the air. Hallelujah. We're going to go to meet him in the air. Hallelujah. But what about today? What about today when we come together in the house of the Lord? Did you miss the house of the Lord while yes. you were away? Amen. Amen. Praise God. I hope that you missed the house of the Lord because we should have missed the house of the Lord. Yes. Amen? Amen. What about today? Hallelujah. 
What a beautiful thought. One day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to collect the saints from the earth. And there in his presence, we will be with the Lord forevermore. Amen. With the shout of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, with the twinkling of an eye. I'm not talking about a blink. I'm not talking about a wink. I'm talking about a twinkle. Like a little fast jerk of your eye. That fast. I'm telling you right now. Believers on earth, are, gravity's going to lose its hold. That's what the word of God says. I'm not making up some science fiction story to you. Hallelujah. With the twinkling of an eye, the, those on earth in Christ, our gravity's going to lose its hold. And they're going to be gone. Hallelujah. The people of God are going to be gone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What a privilege. What about today? It's a privilege to gather together with the saints in the presence of the Lord. Yes. A blessing to be with the people of God in the house of God. Yes. Does the thought of worshiping God and hearing God's word inspire you or encourage you? Is it something that you look forward to? I ask these questions for a purpose. Because if we're not excited about being with believers of like-minded faith, If we're not excited to hear the word about Jesus or enter into praise and worship that has as its sole purpose to exalt Jesus, then we're probably not going to feel very comfortable in heaven because that will be the emphasis there, the exaltation of God, the father and the lamb. I'm just speaking truth to you, brothers and sisters. I mean, the word of God says that there's four creatures in heaven and all they do night and day is cry holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Bible talks about the fact that there's a myriad of saints and you know what they do? They were saved out of every tribe, tongue and nation and they fall down before the throne of God the Father and the Lamb and they cast their crowns at his feet and they say worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb because he purchased the souls of men with his blood. Hallelujah. Maybe if we're not excited about Jesus, maybe we need to question whether or not we've truly been purchased back. Oh no, I'm here to tell you, you have been purchased back by the blood of the Lamb. The question is, have we submitted our lives unto Him? Have we truly said, yes, Lord, I believe that you died to set me free from my sin. You died to save me out of my sin. And Lord, now I desire to surrender my life to you. You are the King, hallelujah, and I bow to you. You know, people gather together around common interests. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but I I don't know why I pay attention to weird things like this. I remember, you know, the first time it hit me was after I had been studying the Bible, I went and ran a marathon one time. I went and ran a marathon in New Orleans. And before we were getting, I mean, I, I, I trained the best I knew how. And I got ready to go, but I realized, man, there's people that have been living their life to run marathons. This is all they do is run marathons, and they run so many marathons that they've created their own little world around running marathons. I'm not trying to pick on I mean, it's just the craziest thing. Some guy's dressed up in a Superman costume. Some guy's dressed up in a ballerina tutu. I'm going to run 27.2 miles in a ballerina tutu. Some of them run two marathons. They done ran one, and they start the second one. And there's this whole group, not everybody looks like that, but there's this whole group of people that are all dressed up funny looking like that. And they, they have a common interest. And it's running marathons. And so, because they want to run, they join little running clubs. I'm, I'm not opposed to running clubs. Please understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to make a point. Uh, they, people have common interests. They like to shoot guns. I mean, you don't have to raise your hand. The camera's not on you if you want to. If you own a handgun, you can raise your hand. It's okay, man. You got an amendment. Pretty sure it's the Second Amendment. I don't know the Constitution like I should. First Amendment, you got a right to talk. Second Amendment, you got a right to bear arms. It's okay to have a gun in America. Yeah. But people love shooting guns so much that they build common interest around shooting guns or biking. Or I used to know a girl that one year she was part of the Orchid Society and the next year she had uh, two Corvettes and she joined the Corvette Club. My point being is that people surround themselves where they have common unities. Amen. Right? Common unity. Community. They build communities off of that, off of, and then I want to also use this word that I use all the time, common union.
Common unities, common unions. They have self, they have interests when they come together. I you, listen, one of my main common interests back in the day was drinking and doing stuff I wasn't supposed to do. So I had a common unity with people that lived that way. And we hung out on bar stools. And we lived, we went to rock and roll bars. And that's what we did, man. We lived a, a, a wannabe rock and roll life. Want to be? <laughs> Didn't have enough money in my pocket. Didn't really, you get the point? But that was our common unity. Hey, dude, let's go get wasted. And we built community around that. Right, right. In people's living rooms, doing things with. Uh, thank God that the Lord has set me free from those things. I don't want to be part of that anymore. It pulled me away from the Lord. It was bringing disaster in my life. It was bringing strife in my life, causing struggle, causing chaos, causing frustration. I don't want to be around it no more. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't want to be around it no more. I don't want. Lord, help me. Give me grace. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Give me grace to remember where I've come from. Yes. Amen. Yes. We need to be aware of these differences. Let me tell you why. This, this first point right here is going to be a long point. It's about the gathering. Today. What about today? See, we need to be aware of these differences because there's been a definite change in the last 10 to 15 years in the church world. Don't let me lose you. The change has been directed to bring the unchurched into the church. I'm not making something up to you that I didn't just sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night. I studied this. I'm here to tell you it started a long time ago, but one of the biggest movers and shakers of this whole thing was Rick Warren. In Saddleback, California, when he started a church, and what they did was they went and knocked on people's doors. If you're tired of hearing me say it, guess what? Get, you're going to be more tired because I'm not going to stop saying the truth. They went knocking on people's doors, and they asked the unchurched, they asked unbelievers, what can we do to make church more comfortable for you? Hmm. Well, you know, and they started taking a little list. Oh, okay. oh, you want us to shorten up the preaching a little bit. Okay, we'll shorten up the preaching. <laughs> You want us to dim the lights a little bit. Okay, we're going to dim the lights. <laughs> you want us to, you want, we, oh, you want some, some lighting effect. Okay. Got to the point where you even got smoke, smoke going on. <laughs> Basically, people want to be entertained. Yeah. That, my friend Sean told me one time he went, literally, this is true. Do what you want with this. Went and visited a church in the woodlands in Texas one time. Somebody invited him to go to church. And it had people who literally brought motorcycle dirt bikes into the church. And they had like ramps and they were doing backflips and stuff like that. It was part of his illustration for his sermon. People want to be entertained. Wow. Wow. The church has been, has been moving in a direction to bring the unchurched into the church. And the approach has been that we in the church find interests that the world will like to connect to. Right? Running, shooting guns. I've been a part of a church like that before. It's called a program church. We build a bunch of programs that people like. And it helps them to stay connected because they have a sense of community. They have a common unity. Right? And, and, and so they find interests that the world will like to connect to. And through those common interests, we draw them into the walls of the church where we say that we will preach the gospel to them. That, that was the big coin phrase back whenever I was part of that church. And I'm not trying to fuss about it. I'm just saying I'm just being real. We'll never change the message. But we might go ahead and tinker with the method. They didn't say tinker. I'm putting that word in there. But we'll never change the message. But we will change the method. Well, the word of God says that he chose the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. Why? Because he chose broken, marred clay to be a vessel through which God would speak. And that way, hallelujah, when God's word goes forth, everybody knows who gets the glory. It's God and not the man. See, we draw them into the walls of the church where we say that then we'll preach the gospel to them. And the thought is that eventually they will respond to the gospel and they will get saved. This is a reverse approach to the way the true church was told to operate. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Verse 18 through 20. It says, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. It means to instruct them. 
It means to take the time to really teach. And it means that the people that are being taught become pupils or learners. And baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We're talking about common unity this morning. And I want you now to see Acts chapter 2, verses 40 and 42. Because listen, this is what the common unity of the church is supposed to be. Amen. 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 You ready for this? It says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Amen. That word untoward, I, I've used it several times here lately. And you remember, you'll, you'll remember when I write it. What is the word in the Greek? Literally, this word. Scoliosis. Save yourself from this crooked and perverse generation. All of us, I, and I know that I, hopefully you don't get too tired of my illustrations and my little one-liners, but I can remember when I used to go to the jail over there at Ashland, and I would preach to them through the little hatch hole, and I would look them in the eyeballs, and they would, they would come. It was about 10 or 12, every little pod that I'd go to that wanted to hear the gospel. The rest of them back there playing their cards, and sometimes I'd holler at them, hey, Brian, this is for you too. All right, preacher, and keep playing, doing their little thing. But the ones that wanted to hear would come up to the hatch hole. And I can remember that I would tell them, we might not have everything in common, bro. Like, in other words, right now, we may not have Jesus in common. But at the same time, you obviously, right now where you are, you want to hear about it. But I'm going to tell you one thing that we do have in common. We were born of Adam. We were born in sin. We were born into the world. We were corrupted and we were bound by sin. Every last one of us. Maybe your sin looked different than my sin, but every last one of us were bound in sin. And we had that common unity together. But hallelujah, there can be a new common unity that we can find ourselves in Christ. But I'm here to tell you that this generation is evil. It's scoliotic. It's curved. It's got a curved and a, and a bit back. And it's going in the wrong direction. Don't tell me that the world's okay. Don't tell me that the ways of the world's okay. And don't tell me that it's okay to bring the ways of the world into the church. Because now it gets all blurred. It gets all diluted. It becomes gray. There's no more black. There's no more white. No, people need to know the difference between the world and the church. Yeah. Peter says, save yourselves from this scoliotic generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day. There were added unto them about 3,000 souls and they continued. This is what they did. Steadfastly in the apostles doctrine, fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now I gotta be honest with you. Sometimes I can sense in my own heart and in my own life that I'm not as excited about the things of God as where I should be, even as a pastor. I'm just being real with you. I'm being transparent. But that means something's wrong with me. That means I need to be going to the Lord and I need to be saying, Lord, change me. Change this area of my heart. Make me hungry to want to be with believers of like-minded faith. Make me hungry to want to be with believers to do things together as a body of Christ. Amen. And why would I want to be spending all my time with people of the world when they don't have Jesus in common with me? Amen. Lord, help me. What's supposed to happen is that we preach Jesus to the world. They hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit convicts them. They get saved. And once they're saved, the nature of God now resides in them. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13 says, In whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. For sake of time, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says that when you get saved, you become a partaker of the divine nature. That means when you hear the word of God and you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. And now you're connected to the very nature of God. He's, he, and he desires to begin to change yes. the desires of your heart. The Spirit of God in you allows you to be connected to the nature of God. And when you're connected to the nature of God, He works in you. Amen. Amen. And He changes your heart. He changes your mindset. Wow. Look at Ezekiel 36, verses 26 through 28. I got a diagnosis for you. Ready? 
Sometimes we got a stony heart. Sometimes that's the problem. That's the diagnosis. A hard heart. He says a new heart. See, Ezekiel's an Old Testament prophet. And he's talking about the new covenant that is to come. And he says in, in the new covenant, I will give you a new spirit. I will put my spirit in you. I will take away your stony or your hard heart. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And I will cause you to walk according to my statutes. And my judgments. The people of God are filled with the spirit of God. The spirit of God in them allows them to partake of the nature of God. The nature of God within the people of God causes them to have a desire to be part of the things of God. Doctrine, fellowship, yes. communion. Yes. And if we don't have that desire, then we should ask ourselves what nature is having its way in us. Hello. Is it the sinful nature that we receive from Adam, Adam or the godly nature of that we receive from Jesus. Real quick, I want you to look, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. I'm talking about mindsets real quick. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And look at this. Be not conformed to this world. It means to be molded. If you allow the world to mold you and to turn you into an image of what it looks like, you're not to be conformed, which means to be molded from an outside source. That's why I talk about the music all the time. That's why I talk about so many things in society, because all these things from society are trying to mold us and they're creating an image for us on what we believe we're supposed to look like. And that image, it doesn't look like, make us look like Jesus. It makes us look like the world. Yep. He says, be not conformed, but be ye transformed. And that word transformed, instead of it, it conformed means to be molded from an outward source. Transformed means that what's in you comes out. It's the word metamorphosis, like the DNA of a butterfly inside of a caterpillar. It's the word transfigured where Jesus, the deity in him, came out and showed outwardly. The truth of the matter is, is that when you get saved, Jesus lives on the inside of you. And when you allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your life, guess what? Jesus starts to come out of you. The common union that holds people together in the church is the fact that we were all sinners heading towards hell. But Jesus died for our sin, changed our hearts, and now the interests of our lives are being changed also. The opposite says, come gather with us. We will find out what you like. We will scratch the itches that you have. But if these people are drawn in this way and we're waiting for people to get saved, then we'll have to dilute the way we preach because they will want to hold on to the interest that they had while they were still in the world. Good. You say, oh, we're never going to change the message. No, that's not the truth, sir. You're going to have to change your message. Because if the people are coming in and you're, you've already brought them in under a different under a disguise of something that's not even the reality and they're going to want to hold on to because you're unwilling to preach the truth and to say that there's a difference and a separation between the world and the church between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness if you're not willing to say that then you're going to have to change the message in order for people to feel comfortable to sit in the, ch the seats of your church we cannot dilute the gospel of Jesus Christ Lord help us the condition of the church is already starting to wither away Way, Lord, wake us up. Give us a backbone. Straighten out our back and give us strength to walk with you. Amen. Yes. Some of the things that I struggled with. You know, this is my question for you. Listen, I'm not, I'm just telling you me. I'm using myself as an example. One of the biggest problems that I struggled with after Christianity, I mean, I pretty much stayed away from all the drugs because I knew that was wrong, but alcohol was legal and I'm an adult. So how are you going to tell me that I can't drink? And then once I got my degree, oh man, now I really feel I'm really important. Not just my first degree, but my second degree. I got a master's degree now. I'm sitting with the doctor. And so guess what? They drink wine, I can drink wine. Well, the word of God tells me don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but instead be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. See, I don't know about you. This is my answer for you right here. I'm going to leave it on the table. I got a question. Do you act like a Christian when you drink? No. I, got, I got a couple of people that said no. Can I tell you? 
Pastor Matt don't act like no Christian when he drinks. <laughs> They never made a video because nobody cares to watch it, but it'd be like boys going wild. <laughs> Don't act nothing like a Christian. Act like a fool. Doing everything opposite of what the Bible tells me to do. And you know what? It was so hard for me to get that revelation in my head. And But once the Lord finally revealed that to me, that's how I knew it was sin. For Matt. Because Matt don't act like a Christian when he drinks. My main point is that one day we will be gathered together with him. We will be in his presence forevermore. But if today we aren't interested in gathering for his purpose and we are more concerned or interested in gathering with people that are worldly, then we need to question what is wrong. Lord, help us in our heart. Amen. Point number two, we're still talking about the enemy right here. But look, he deceives with false doctrine to steal the truth from men's hearts. Going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse... Um, well, let's just start at verse 5. It says, That day will not come. <clears throat> it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The day of our gathering together with him will be preceded by some things. And once again, I already said it. There's some various opinions about it. But that word uh, falling away is literally apostasia. The word apostasy means a, deser a desertion or a departure from one's religious principles. Mm. That, that means basically really what I just described to you in point number one. We change the way, the methods of how we do church. And so by reason of this insanity, we have to basically change the message of what we preach. See, what this means is that there are specific things that are taught in the Bible so that the people of God will know what God asks of them. And an apostasia is a falling away or a moving away from those things. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that I believe this apostasia has already been going on. I'm not saying that it won't get worse. As a matter of fact, I believe, Lord, help us that there's going to be some preachers some churches that will actually embrace the beast system. Help us. But even what I'm trying to tell you is right now, people are being prepared for that delusion and that deception as we speak. Because the whole, the way that the word of God is being presented is being changed. The idea of a desertion from the religious principles is taught other places in the Bible in the New Testament. I know we use this scripture a lot. First Timothy chapter four, verse one, it says now the spirit, not Matt, not brother swagger, the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith and that they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Give heed means that they will attend to it. It means that they will lend their ear to it. They're going to be willing to lend their ear to false teaching, false preaching, a false way that will ultimately seduce them and blind them towards deception. They, 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 gave, they departed because they gave heed. They listened to and connected themselves to the false teachings and they were influenced and in, that by a message that was empowered by demonic spirits. You know, demonic spirits operate by exciting sensual appetites. You ever notice that before? Yes. Demonic spirits operate by exciting the sensual appetites of the flesh. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, it's not that hard. If whatever feels good to your flesh... And, and, and it's against the word of God. Demon spirits will try to make you go that way. Hello. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Hello. I mean, this is supposed to be an adult class here this morning. Well, Lord help me. Let's just keep it PG-13. <laughs> you just, you can, you got, use your adult mind and you can imagine in your adult mind or your teenage mind, whatever it is that, that it would cause you to feel a certain way that just feels so good, but it's contrary to the word of God. But what I want is I want to feel good. And so I'm going to move towards that very thing that makes me feel good, no matter what the word of the Lord says. Yeah. 
And demon spirits are more than happy to cackle and laugh Amen. and say, oh, yeah, don't you know that it feels so good? Come on, get you a little bit more. Right? Right. right. Yeah. Second Timothy chapter four, verses two. That's what they do. These these demon spirits it says to young to the young preacher, though, Timothy, Paul says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. My ears itch. My ears want to hear pleasant words. When I walk out of the church, I don't want to feel down. I don't like the way that preacher called out what I was doing. I want to feel good. Speak pleasant words to me, preacher. And if you don't give me the words that I want to hear, I'm going to change the channel till I can find another preacher that will tell me the things that I want to hear. Well, we showed up to the wrong place. Hallelujah. We showed up to the wrong place because this preacher can't do that. I'm more concerned about the audience of one than I am the audience of many. Amen. Preach the word. Why would you even want to go to a church to hear some preacher tell you something that's not true? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Because we won't play church. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be deceived. And even if we're not in the place where we should be with the Lord, we should still want to hear the word of the Lord because guess what it does? It reproves. That means it brings correction to our life. It rebukes. Man, sometimes the preacher just reading the word of the Lord. I'm like, ooh. You know what the word rebuke means? It means to bring correction, but not only that, to show you that you're wrong. The word of the Lord will do that from the top down. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. It'll do it to each and every one of us and we'll let it. Yes. But it also exhorts. It means refreshing. It's the same word spoken of of the Holy Spirit, parakaleo, to be called alongside. The, the, the Holy Spirit is the comforter, the one called alongside to help the word of the Lord under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit will do the same thing. Hallelujah. It'll correct you and it'll show you that you're wrong, but it will also bring refreshing. Hallelujah. And it will lift the weight and the burden of sin off of your life. I know that, you know, I can't, I can't really, I guess I still think, you know, I still got a little... There's a part to me that wants to still have this image, I guess, of being cool, but I can't imagine, you know, to be so lightened by the burden of sin that you're just skipping around all over the place. That wouldn't look too cool, right? But wouldn't it be nice to be that free? Yeah. Hallelujah! To be that free, just skipping around, doing all back in the old church that I first got saved in, called Twin City Gospel. They do something called the Jericho March. Right? And I mean, you know, it was nothing more aggravating than somebody trying to make you do the Jericho march with them. But boy, let me tell you, when the Holy Ghost hits you, and it, and it just, sometimes you just felt like getting up and running. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. Get up and just take on running for Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And there, you know, that's refreshing, man, when the Lord... The Lord shows us because a lot of times we're walking around under a burden of guilt and condemnation. Right. And the enemy heaps all of that on us. But when we come to the Lord, amen, and we make it right, there's a refreshing that takes place. Yes. He lifts that burden off of us. The preaching of the truth, while it, make us, while it may make us feel at times uncomfortable because it brings correction in our lives about things that are wrong, it also brings comfort and refreshing because it provides an opportunity for repentance and repentance brings the refreshing presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you know the word repent? I know that we share this a lot, but it literally means to have your mind changed. So whatever it was that was in your mind that was wrong and contrary to God, whenever you come to the realization that it was wrong and you agree with God that it was wrong, I mean, do we really have to start listing off all the stuff that's wrong? <laughs> well, how can you say smoking weed is wrong, preacher? Because it grows in the garden, man. And, you know, that I used to try to, I was in my third rehab and I was trying to tell the people that. <laughs> I was in my third rehab, dude. My life was falling apart. I'm like, whoa, man, herb grows in the ground, bro. God created this stuff. 
And they're like, you're, you're destitute, man. All you got is the hair on your head. You walked in there with rags on your back. You have no money in your pocket. Your life is falling apart. And you're over here like trying to make a testimony, the defense for marijuana. Right. Right. Lord, help us. Amen. Repent means to have a mind change. That's good. Yeah. It means I finally come to the realization that what God says is right and what I've been saying was wrong. Yes, Lord. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And whenever I do that, my sins can be blotted out. I mean, God will remove them as far as from the east to the west. But in this particular passage of scripture, the word blotted out means to line something. Yeah. I didn't even know what that. I didn't know that there was an actual word. That's, that's actually used as a verb. The word lime can be used as a verb. I looked it up today. To lime something means to like whitewash it. You need, you need your sin limed. It's like they got it. Like, a, like getting some plaster and just. Psh, psh. See, it was always before you before. Before you repented, before you got your mind right about your sin. Your sin was always before you before. You saw it everywhere you went. It was weighing you down. It was condemning you. But when you got right with the Lord and you allowed your mind to line up with him according to his word and you repented of your sin, it's like the Lord just put some lime on it. Now when you now when you look in the mirror, you don't, you don't see your sin anymore. Hallelujah. And, it, and there's a refreshing that takes place because of the presence of the Lord showing up in the midst of your life. Lord help us. Amen. Verse, uh, part number, I'm sorry, point number three. <laughs> Closing with this. You ready? The enemy wants to take the place of God any way he can. <clears throat> Going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. It says of this Antichrist, he opposes and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So all of this passage of scripture is talking about a future day, a future gathering, a future deception. Because listen, during that time frame, the enemy, like we said, is going to be given power like Pharaoh's magicians were given power. He will be able to call fire down from heaven. He will delude people through deception and through he will be given a mouth to speak lies and it will put people into a hypnotic state and they will believe it. It's like he will be speaking witchcraft and people will be cast under a spell. And it, but listen to me, it's happening today. Satan wants to replace God any way that he can. In Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Listen to me. It didn't work when he tried. It. Luke chapter 10 verses 18 says this. Luke 10, 18 and 19 Says that Jesus said this, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Then he goes on to say this, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I got good news for you this morning. The enemy tried to exalt his throne above the throne of God, but Jesus said, In my pre incarnate state, what does he mean? What am I saying? What do I mean? I mean, when Jesus was the word that spoke the world into existence, he saw Satan try to elevate himself above the father. And he saw Satan get cast out of heaven and fall to the earth like lightning. And good news, good news. Not only did Satan get cast to the earth, but Jesus has all authority in him. And he's telling you and I, as his disciples, that he has given us power to have victory over these demon spirits, which are described as serpents. Serpents and scorpions. That's basically like what, what they are. They're under our feet. Yes. They're ground dwellers. And the Lord's saying, I have given you power to tread on them. 
Satan wanted to take the place of God in heaven and he was expelled from that place. Now he wants to take the place of God on earth. Like that scripture said that he wants to exalt himself and sit in the temple of God. And I do believe that there's going to be a literal physical temple rebuild that the Antichrist will want us, that will try, he will try to sit in. But I got to tell you something, that the word of God also talks a whole lot about this temple right here. The word of God talks a whole lot about this temple right here. Yes. Did you not know that you are the temple of the living God? Yes. And the enemy wants to try to get on the inside through false doctrine, through a false way, any way that he can to get in. The sin and lies he offers causes great deception and will result in blindness from the truth. I'm closing with this scripture right here. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. It says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Look at this. This is scary. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We all know God is a loving God. Amen. Amen. As he's gracious and he's merciful and he's kind and he's forgiving. What a sad day that one day grace is going to run out. And that all of those people that had had the opportunity to believe the truth but had refused the truth. The truth will be given a strong delusion so that they would believe a lie. Because you know what the reality is? Is that many times people want to believe a lie. Because the lie serves their purposes more than the truth. Just as God will allow the Antichrist to cause great deception at the last moments, God still is allowing certain levels of deception to take place now. But in the words of Jesus, I want to share this last scripture with you. I can't what I said the last one was the last one. <laughs> Here we go. You ready? Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. You know what the word sanctified means? <laughs> If this is the world and this is the kingdom of God and you were born here broken and dead. You see that scoliosis right there. You were born crooked and when you get saved, guess what? The Lord takes you out of the world and puts you in Christ. The word sanctified means to be made holy. It means to be set apart. It means to be separated. The word of the Lord, the truth of God's word will separate us from the world.